Today we take a look at the EZT3D Foldable S2. Hey everybody, Chris here. This is the Foldable S2 from EZT3D, a printer manufacturer in China. And this one is just a bit different, because you noticed that I said foldable. So let's just get that out of the way first. Yes, you can fold the gantry on this printer down and lay it somewhat flat. You have to have your x-axis all the way up, and once that's complete, take a look at the sides. You have two screws, one on either side of this gantry frame on both sides. You can remove those four, and once those are out, the whole gantry just lays down in front. And if you save the box that it comes in, it has this packing foam. It fits nice and snug on both ends. It'll slide right back into its original box, close up, and it even has a handle on top. Now, after you transport it, you're not gonna get away without leveling the bed again, of course, but it does fold all the same. Other than that feature, it does have a 235 by 235 by 250 millimeter build volume. It has a heated bed with a glass sheet on top. It does have some sort of ultra base like coating on it. It does unstick relatively well when the bed cools down. It has a somewhat unique extruder setup. It is direct drive and it has a volcano like heat block with that extra long nozzle. It does have dual lead screws, a color touch screen and a 32 bit main board. And it also has silent stepper drivers, which is always a nice feature to have. Now during the live stream, I did have a few issues with this printer when I assembled it. It didn't work quite right, but this is a pre-release unit, so that can be expected sometimes. But let's just go over the things that I like about this machine, some of the issues that I had, just take a look at some of the features, and maybe some of the drawbacks of a printer like this. And let's just start with the heat bed. Nothing super special here. It does appear to be a glass sheet glued on an aluminum bed. It gets up to 100 just fine. This is something like Ultra Base, like I said before, but I've already pulled a piece out of it. I did have a couple of occasions where I had to re-level. Maybe I was just a little bit too close on this one, but I've used Ultra Base type coatings a lot in the past, and I've never had this happen before. So beware of that. Onto the touchscreen, it's a pretty common layout. It's actually a little bit of the older layout. You're starting to see more of the unified layouts like on the Big Tree Tech screens. This one doesn't have near as many features. A lot of it's there. Preheat, filament load, fan settings, some advanced settings. They do have power off or zoom. You can continue to print. Disable steppers. You even get some advanced settings. You can do auto shut off after the print's complete, things like that. Nothing wrong with it at all, but pretty typical for the touchscreen layout that you're going to see. And here on the Y-axis, we don't have that center beam like you're used to seeing on a lot of these beds roll on those wheels. You actually have two 2020s, and I kind of like this design a little bit better. As long as these are square, it widens the stance on that bed. I think it gives you a little bit more stability. You also have a spot here where you can tension that belt. A lot of these machines, you don't see that. I know I'm kind of sorry to say that. You have your micro SD card over here on the right, as well as USB-B. OctoPrint does work great on this machine. Manual bed level, no sensor on this one, but you don't really need it. It's pretty stable. Again, you're gonna have to level it every time you fold. A better look at the folding pivot here. These are made of steel. You have these inductive type end stops. They seem to work just fine, but you don't see that on every printer. And to protect it while it's folding, it does have some wire wrap here, so you don't get any of those wires pinched. You do get dual lead screws. These are TR8x8s, the standard Ford start screws you see on pretty much everything. And then onto the extruder hot end setup. Now you will notice that a lot of things on this printer are fed with these flat ribbon cables. The way this printer set up reminds me a lot of the Sidewinder X1. Now this does seem to work okay. We have some breakout boards supporting things. Again, there's cable here all the way down to underneath the printer. But eventually, you're going to wear out these connections. And this one here doesn't even have a latch. It just presses in there and you hope for the best. Now they do give you an extra ribbon cable. I haven't had any issues yet, but I've only got about 100 hours on this machine. Eventually you will have to replace one of these. So just keep that in mind. But let's take a closer look at this extruder hot end. So we have our part cooling here. It's the flat type that you see on a lot of Ender style printers. You have the breakout board that's supported by that ribbon cable where everything plugs in, a shorter NEMA 17 motor, and then your extruder gear housing. This button right here is actually the idler, so you can load the filament. 
And if we take the fan off on the outside, you just have your heat sink here. You can actually see through it to the idler gear and the extruder gear. It is exiting the air off the side. And then if we take this off, it's kind of a somewhat unique implementation of the old school Mark 8 style extruder. You still have that brass gear, but the idler is on the back side and it's spring loaded in a cartridge. So that's somewhat unique. It is all metal in here. It's very sturdy. And then down here you have your set screw to hold in your volcano style block. And if you'll notice, inside this heat sink is a really tiny micro switch for filament runout. I've never actually seen this type of switch used on a printer before. Pretty ingenious. And then from there we have our extra long heat block. It does come with a silicone sock. And it's almost identical to the Volcano setup where you have your thermistor and heat cartridge from the top and it sandwiches it on the side. Again, these are the extra long nozzles that you see and you do get a couple of replacements. They're all 0.4s. It does retain the heat very well. I think you could probably print faster and hotter if you wanted to get a larger nozzle. I think this is more than capable of doing that. And something else I wanted to touch on that they list on their Kickstarter page is this sensor right here. Now they're using it as your end stop and I get that, but they also say something about adjusting the eccentric nuts on the Z that this can compensate for that. So if you have them too tight or too loose, this sensor is able to tell what the condition they're in and something in the firmware adjusts that. I'm not sure what that's all about. It doesn't seem to make a difference to me, but I do hope to get just a little bit more information on that in the future. That sounds somewhat interesting. And as far as the firmware goes, they do say that it's an open source project, so that's good to hear. But I don't have the source yet. So hopefully they post that after the printer's released. I hope it's Marlin or some other project so it's easy to use and make modifications. Now all in all, this printer is just a pretty basic 3D printer that's pretty solid. I mean, it's got dual lead screws, direct drive. There's nothing wrong with that. But now let's take a look at the guts. Let's see what board they're using and just what's under the covers. And if you watch the live stream, we did take a look at all of this because we did have a bad stepper driver. I'm not sure exactly what happened with all that, but my X axis did not work correctly. I swapped out the driver. They gave me an extra one and it started working fine. I haven't had any problems since. But pretty much all of this is maker base. We have the maker base MKS touchscreen. This is a Robin Nano board. And we have a generic brand power supply. It's listed as a 240 watt, 24 volt. It's on the small side, but it doesn't have a fan. So it makes the printer a lot quieter. And there's a close up of our main board. We do get 2208 stepper drivers. They're running in standalone mode. And this is just a regular MKS Robin. It's a version 1.2. You can get these right off the shelf for any 3D printer. So just seeing the board, I'm gonna guess that they're probably running Marlin on this machine. It does work great with OctoPrint, but you got a fan to cool all your drivers. You have a few extra ports. There is room for another extruder. Or if you wanted to use that for an additional Z lead screw, you could move that screw over to there. Pretty standard fare. A lot of open ports up here though that you could play with if you wanted to. Ribbon cable interface for that TFT screen. A BL touch port, servo ports, just standard stuff if you want to add to it. I'm not exactly sure on the Robin board, but I think there's even a Wi-Fi module that you can get for these. So not a bad setup underneath. And with that Robin board, you can go right over to Marlin, no problems at all, even if this firmware doesn't turn out so well. But I'm sure it'll be fine, especially if they continue to put out updates. Now, one thing with silent steppers like those 2208s, just how quiet is this printer? Well, it's pretty quiet. I'm just kidding, we'll test it. Here's with just the fans running. And here's it printing with the part fan on. Something also worth noting, this does support the model thumbnails on the screen. I'm not exactly sure how to get Crucial Slicer to do that. That's what I use for these files. I don't know how that works yet. I know Cura does it out of the box, but it does support it. So I'll figure that out and get back to you. And here's the bed at 60C. It's actually pretty consistent all over the bed, but that's what I would expect for a glass sheet. Once it warms up, it stays pretty warm. And here's the bed at 100C. Again, fairly consistent, maybe a little cool in the corners, but again, this is glass. So it looks pretty good. An issue I actually found during this review, full transparency, I have been printing PETG on this 
at 8590C for a long time. No issues at all. But when I went to 100C just to take the thermal reading, I just happened to notice that the adhesive that holds this glass down has given way. This will probably slide off here pretty easily. I will make sure the company knows about this. Hopefully you don't get a printer with this same adhesive. But if you do, I guess your only alternative is to get some binder clips to put on the corners. So all in all, this is a fair 3D printer. Now the adhesive on the bed that I just found was kind of an eye opener. I'll make sure they know about that. And there are also some concerns about cable strain relief on the bed back here. That shouldn't be moving freely. We need to have something solid to tie that to. I've also run into a few firmware bugs, especially when trying to resume a print after power off and when the filament runs out. But I'm hoping all of that will be resolved by the time you, the backers start getting their machines. But given all the downsides, a pretty solid little 3D printer. It has all the stuff you would want to see, direct drive, dual lead screws, touch screen, all the features, filament run out. And on top of that, it is foldable. So you can stick it back in the box, carry it from place to place. I think that does deserve a few points in the pros column. A couple of really easy things that I would like to see updated on this printer. One is some sort of macro to get you into foldable mode. Just something to raise the Z axis all the way to the top. Maybe put the bed in the center, wherever it needs to be. Just a key to get you ready to fold it up. Also, you just have screws here to hold the gantry in place when you do stand it up. These could easily be replaced with thumb screws, making it way more convenient. Also, when it's folded down, if there were a couple of clips or something like that on both sides to hold the gantry in place so it wasn't moving while you were trying to get it back in the box, that would be a huge plus. And maybe a magnetic tray or some spot on the frame where you could store your thumb screws when it was folded. That way you don't have to worry about keeping track of anything. Fold it up, put the thumb screws where they need to go, put it in the box, and you're ready to go next time you want to get it out. Just some suggestions. And to be 100% completely honest with all of you, when the company told me that this thing folded, I said yes. I've always been really interested in that idea. I have this image of a giant 3D printer that you could flat pack that just has a handle on top and you can carry it around. That's not exactly what this is, but I definitely wanted to check it out. So enough about all the gimmicks, the folding, and what this printer does. What does the print quality look like? Let's check it out. So let's start here. This is DaVinci from the live stream. This is my standard profile I use on everything. No tweaks at all. It came out really well. Super impressed with this first print, especially from a printer that folds up. Then I moved to a little cheaper filament just to start testing, just to see what the printer could do. I also printed a bunch of spool holder parts with this machine, so it's got a little more time on it than you're gonna see here in the test prints but it handled Jesse just fine. Quality looks okay. And then with all printers, I usually like to test it out to make sure my E-steps, extrusion width, everything's just fine. You'll see some inconsistency in here, that isn't a huge deal. But this is a two wall print at 0.45, and it nailed it. All sides are within a hundredth of a millimeter, whatever the settings are on the firmware, no need to adjust it. That's not real common on a lot of 3D printers. Most of the time they at least need just a little bit of tweaking. And then we moved to Adelinda. It turned out just fine. I was still using that lower end PLA. I was running it a bit hot, so you see some stringing up here, but still a pretty decent print. Definitely need a bit of tweaking there. But then I moved on to a 200% Sir Layers a lot, just for fun. And I started to see just a little bit of inconsistency in the shield. Now this isn't uncommon, but you can usually dial your printer in so that goes away. Then I started playing around with printing speeds. This is a zombie head from Wexter. Vedrin always does a great job. There are some inconsistencies here. You're getting the Halloween edition of printer testing. But there's even a few layers that might be missing just a bit. We can do better. So I slowed the external parameters down a bit and I tried a lattice cube. It fared pretty well most of the time on these. You see overhang where it's real rough underneath. This one seemed to be able to cool the plastic enough where you didn't see that. A pretty good quality print. And then once in a while I like to run these print tests. Just to get an idea of bridging, it did it really well. 
all the holes are nice and round. The text is a little off, maybe not as precise as it needs to be. And small perimeters, they're a little messy, but there's a lot of printers that can't complete those. So it did a fair job. But after I tweaked the slicer a bit, got the speed that I thought the printer needed, I ended up with 40 millimeters a second on the perimeters. I re-ran Wexter's zombie head. And this one came out much better. It's amazing what just a little bit of slicer tuning can do. Let's have a look side by side. Now I know they're different filament, but the green one is obviously a lot higher quality. Probably a little more obvious when you see the layer consistency here on the side. They're minimal improvements, but they are there. Then sticking with the zombie theme, I did the zombie head from last year's Halloween from Fotis. It turned out decent, it has a lot of fine features here, especially on the stitching on the mouth. You have to use supports, which they came off pretty easy, but sometimes that can kind of offset some of the detail, but still came out really well. And then I wanted to try something that had a lot of detail, so I did this tower. And it came out really well after I got the slicer tuned just a bit. All the stairs are nice and crisp. It does have a cap that goes on it that you can print separate, so it's hollow in the center. And then you can glue the top on if you want. So you can put your candy in here if you want. Keep it safe. And of course I wanted to try some PETG. It handled it like a champ. This is Green Gate. It's just a quick test print. I wanted to see how much it'd string. No problem at all. And then I tried to print out some of these buckles. This is Prusament PETG. I didn't get the supports quite right. But this is a really cool print. Especially for PETG because it kind of has that snap to it. I find when testing a printer, if you're going to test PETG, having something like this that's actually functional really tells you the quality of the print. These unfortunately just didn't come out all that well. I'll give it another shot. So there it is, the foldable S2. You've seen the good, the bad, and the print quality. And it is important to mention that this is an early release unit. Any bugs that I find, I do feed them back to the manufacturer, and hopefully they have all been resolved by the time the backers get to their machine. So what you see here might not be exactly what you get. With that, should you back this Kickstarter? The Kickstarter is active for a few more days, and at the highest tier, this machine is somewhere around $270 US. I'm not sure what the final price will be after the Kickstarter is over, but in that range, that gets you kind of close to a Creality Ender 3 V2 or a Lotmax SC10 Shark. And it's important to remember, this machine was designed to be somewhat portable. I think the print quality on this machine can hold its own with a lot of other machines in this range. And although I think the folding is really cool, I'm not sure how many users are actually going to need this feature or want this feature on a 3D printer. At the end of the day, it is a very capable i3 Cartesian machine, the print quality looks decent, and it has a pretty nice feature set. And it does one more trick after all of that. And it seems like I've been saying this a lot nowadays, but remember, this is a Kickstarter campaign. If you back it, that's just a donation. The company doesn't necessarily have to deliver anything. So that's it for today. I hope you liked this one, and I will see you very soon on the next one.